Hey, so for today's, today's lecture, we're going to talk about ecosystems and communities. And what we mean by that, uh, it, an ecosystem is a community of biological organisms plus the non-living components with which those organisms interact. And how we define an ecosystem, ecosystem is kind of up to us. Uh, we can define it of any size. So we could talk about the ecosystem of all of the LA area, or we could talk of the ecosystem within the fur of a sloth, which we are going to in just a moment. Um, a, an ecosystem uh, is made up of a biotic environment, meaning everything that's alive. A community is all the living organisms in a specific area. And again, we can define that area any way we want it, if any size, large or small. And the abiotic environment is the physical environment of non-living things. So this in includes the chemical resources of an environment, what kind of nutrients are available in the soil, for example, and then the physical conditions as well. Uh, is there, are there other live, are there other, uh, is, sorry, is there rocks around? Is there dirt around? Is, uh, is there uh, pavement? Uh, has the environment been built on or not? All of those kinds of things are part of the abiotic environment. So when we talk about the ecosystem, we're talking about the biological community as well as the physical environment that that's in. So let's talk about a sloth for a moment. And um, this link is, link is gonna take you to a really great article in the uh, LA Times about this study uh, from the Proceedings of the Royal Society talking about this ecosystem that, in, that involves the fur of the three-toed sloth. So these sloths spend most of their days living in the forest canopy in the rainforest. The canopy is the upper part of the trees. And the sloths, eat the leaves of these trees. And these are really, really tough leaves, low in nutrients, very hard to digest. So the sloths, these three-toed sloths, have the slowest digestion of any mammal. And their digestion is so slow that they only poop about once a week, and they have to go down to the florist, forest floor to do that, to defecate. So when they do that, um, a, this is risky because they make themselves susceptible to predators, but also it uses a ton of energy. About 8% of their daily calories um, is used to do this journey. Now, there is another kind of sloth called a two-toed sloth, totally different. Obviously, this one has three toes on its front paws. The other one has two toes on the front paws. Obviously, totally different. The two-toed sloths poop from the trees. Why do the three-toed sloths go down to the ground? I don't know, but they do. And good thing for this moth species that lives in the sloth's fur. The adults live in the sloth's fur. When the, uh, after they mate, the pregnant, pregnant female moths go down to the ground with the sloth and lay their eggs in the pile of dung or poop on the ground. The larvae, those are the worms that hatch out of the eggs, those then live in the, in the dung pile and feed off of the dung until they mature into adult moths. The adults then leave the dung pile, fly up into the canopy, canopy and search for a sloth. When they uh, find a sloth and they make their home there, they mate, uh, they poop in the sloth fur and that moth poop provides nitrogen uh, in the nutri nutrition uh, for an algae. And the algae then lives in the sloth fur. Uh, and the algae can survive really well because the sloth hair has little tiny cracks in it that water can uh, hang out in, water can store in. And so the, um, the algae then lives in those cracks and the sloth eats the algae uh, that, store, that gets stored in its fur. So this whole cycle depends on the sloth having this really hard to digest diet of leaves going down to the ground to poop once a week. That, that poop then feeds the moths, which feed the algae, which feed the, um, the sloth. So this whole system is a single ecosystem 
totally interdependent. All the members of it depend on all the other members. Ecosystems are systems, which means the biologists are able to monitor and measure the system uh, and measure how the activity of one part of the system affects the other parts of the system. So we can talk about different kinds of ecosystems and different sizes. One kind of very large ecosystem is a biome. So this is like the, you know, the, the other end of the extreme. So the, the sloth, the fur of a sloth is a really small ecosystem. A biome is a really, really large ecosystem. And a biome is a large ecosystem with similar environmental conditions and life forms in different places in the earth. So a desert is a biome, for example. Biomes are categorized based on how much rain, uh, what their average temperature is throughout the year um, and what the average is for each season, what the average rainfall is in a given season or in a given year, how much the temperature fluctuates. Um, for example, temperatures at the equator don't actually fluctuate very much, but as you get toward the poles, you can have really big fluctuations in temperatures. Is the rainfall constant or does it fall within a certain season? So, for example, um, we live in a chaparral biome that gets a lot of rain in the winter sometimes uh, and very little to no rain in the summer. So terrestrial biomes, those are on land, uh, are determined by the temperature, the temperature variation, the, and the amount of precipitation. So tropical forests, that's this dark orange color. We see them along the, uh, around the equator usually. Lots and lots of rainfall, very constant temperatures, not a lot of temperature fluctuation. Deserts are very, very dry, also kind of closer to the equator. Um, getting very, very little rainfall, but often with a, a lot of temperature fluctuation. Savannas are grasslands that can be very dry for long seasons and then get a lot of rain in one season. Again, we're the chaparral. We're here and around the Mediterranean. That's all chaparral in this part of Australia. And then as we get uh, closer to the poles, both north and south, we see different kinds of biomes. But we can use these categorizations to make predictions about what kinds of organisms and what kinds of ecosystems we could see in various areas based on what we know about that region of the Earth. Now, aquatic biomes, these are water, based on water, these are different depending on uh, whether the water is salt or fresh water, how much the water moves, and how deep the water is. So most of the earth is covered by open ocean that tends to be uh, deep, although depths change a lot in different parts of the ocean. Uh, it is salt water. Uh, where those meet um, Rivers, you see estuaries and wetlands that have a mixture of salt and fresh water. Coral reefs uh, tend to congregate around the poles and, or not the, sorry, the equator, not the poles, and uh, are areas where there is a lot of biodiversity in shallow waters. Rivers and streams are moving shallow, uh, fresh water, not necessarily that shallow, but fresh water. And uh, lakes and ponds, of course, are more still fresh water. All right, so <clears throat> a region's temperature and rainfall together is called its weather. And the weather is part of the ecosystem. Because the sun shines most directly on the equator of the Earth, the parts around the equator are warmer and have a more consistent temperature. Now, this causes different weather because warm air is able to hold on to more moisture than cold air. And as you know, hot air rises. So 
because the sun shines on the equator, heats up the air, that hot air rises and holds a lot of water. As that air cools, uh, sorry, as that air rises into the atmosphere, it cools and cool air holds less moisture. So uh, first droplets form together uh, as clouds and then as the air cools even further and it can hold less water, then the water falls out of that air as rain. So that's this process here. The air on the land gets heated, it rises up. It's also very, it can hold on to a lot of moisture from here. It rises up, it carries that moisture as it rises and as it rises, it cools because the atmosphere is thinner higher up and it holds less heat those uh the cooling air loses that moisture that forms uh, clouds and then eventually rain now where that water falls ha can be affected by the topography or the physical features of the land and the topography of land includes the features created by humans so uh, nature creates mountains and we know that higher altitudes have lower temperatures because the air is literally thinner there's fewer gases in the air to hold on to and bind to water and temperature uh mountains create rain shadows but we're going to talk in a minute about the uh, features created by humans and how those affect the weather as well but let's start with the mountains so this is a diag this is a satellite picture of the Andes Mountains in South America on the west coast of South America. And you see we've got the ocean here. We've got lots of green here and on the mountains. And then as we get to the eastern side of the mountains, they turn brown and then on the eastern side of the mountains we have this desert. So what has happened is that there's lots of moisture in the air over the ocean. And uh, as that air moves over land, it heats up as the land warms. And as it heats up, it rises. That pulls more moisture laden air from the ocean to the land. The air rises over the land and because the moisture and the air is being pulled in from the ocean to replace the rising air that creates wind that further pushes the air across the mountains as the air goes across the mountains it cools and it drops rain and so we get this green area over the mountains where that rain has dropped once the air passes over the mountains and starts to go back down, two things happen. One is that the air has become warmer and can hold more moisture. The other is that it has dropped the moisture that it was holding. So then we have very, very dry air uh, coming down off the mountain.